Today, we need to talk about financial stress. Hello again, it's Martin North from Digital Finance Analytics, where I've noticed post covering finance and problem news with a distinctively Australian flavour. Well, once again, I've updated my mortgage and rental stress modelling based on our surveys. This is, of course, taking data up to the end of May from our 52,000 household sample. And the news is not good. So today I want to do three things. Firstly, I'll walk through the overall findings from our results. Secondly, I'll drill down into some of the mapping. And thirdly, I'll also pick a few postcodes and we can look at some individual answers at that level. Now, just before we start, I need to again remind you the way I define stress. This is a cash flow measure. So we look at money in, money out. And our definition essentially is if households are spending more on necessities, and that's everything from paying the mortgage or the rent through to groceries or power or fuel or loan repayments, whatever it might be, if that is higher than the money coming into the household from all income sources, including government support, then we define them as in stressed. Now, stress doesn't mean an immediate financial crisis nor an immediate default, but it does signal problems insofar that people will then have to make significantly hard choices about what they spend their money on, what they decide to do and what they decide not to do. For example, we've noticed quite a few people have given up on dental treatment or they've decided to spend less on clothes because they have to eat. And of course, with inflation running at over 5% officially, of course, the real number's a lot bigger. And with non-discretionary inflation closer to 6.6%, we know that there are significant pressures ahead. And of course, on Tuesday, the Reserve Bank will be lifting rates. Not sure how much, maybe 40 basis points, but that'll flow through to higher mortgage repayments ahead. So it is important to understand what's going on not least because it means that you've got more chance of them preparing. But also I want to address this specifically to policymakers and those in positions of authority who don't seem to understand the degree of discomfort there is out there across Australia at the moment. Many households are doing it really tough. They have been for some time, but the pace of stress has accelerated. So let me first look at the overall trend of stress. And to do that, we'll look at our latest chart. So this is showing you, firstly, the rate of mortgage stress right the way back to 2000, when it was just over 10% of borrowing households in difficulty, up through now to a new height of 43% of households. And as we'll see shortly, that's a large number in real terms. It's also worth noting again that in February 2020, that was before COVID hit, we were at 32.9%. So the combined impact of government policy, Reserve Bank policy and other regulators has been to end up with a significantly higher number of households in mortgage stress. Now, we can also plot the same for rental stress. And in fact, up until about 2017, you can see there that rental stress was pretty much tracking mortgage stress. And then from there onwards, as interest rates came down and as other pressures on households increased, we started to see mortgage pressure rising because of larger loans relative to rental stress. Rental stress then shot up through COVID and over the following couple of years, thanks to various support mechanisms and other issues, we saw quite a lot of volatility in rental stress. But it continued to track below mortgage stress until recently, but unfortunately it's now taken off. 
and 46% of households who are renting are now registering rental stress. In other words, they are struggling to make rental repayments and meet their other obligations from a financial perspective. And frankly, given everything that I'm seeing at the moment, I expect this to get worse ahead. And by the way, we can also just overlay there the total household debt, according to the Reserve Bank, which has been accelerating again. It's 186.2 based on data up till February. We'll get some more data soon. And once again, of course, this is the proliferation of mortgages, bigger mortgages. The average loan size has got quite a lot bigger. So this is an unprecedented level of financial stress, whether you are a mortgage holder or whether you are making rental repayments. And the point I want to make is that while some households over the last couple of years have increased their savings buffers and from a financial sense are doing very well, the proportion of households who are in difficulty is rising very quickly. Now, this is partly a function of the significant inflationary pressures, the higher debt and the higher rents. So facing into what we're going to experience ahead with higher interest rates, this is, of course, very concerning. So I want now to move on and look at the May 2022 stress summary. And just to explain again how this works, we report at a state level the number of households in mortgage stress, in rental stress. We also have data on those stressed investors and an aggregate financial stress measure, which is measured against all households. And then we display that information in terms of the proportion of households who are also in difficulty. So, for example, those in mortgage stress are measured against borrowing households and the proportion of those in rental stress are measured compared to those renting. The proportion of investors who are stressed are measured against those who are investors. And the aggregate financial stress measure is an overall measure compared with the total number of households. And I have highlighted here the significant rises in yellow where compared with last month stress is higher and from a mortgage stress perspective we can see that there was a rise in the ACT in New South Wales in South Australia and in Victoria and the total number 42.97 percent of households or 1.595 million households are in stress across the country turning to rental stress in fact, there were significant rises everywhere last month. And now we have 46.7% of households who are renting in stress. And that translates to more than 2.25 million households. Most investors are also in some difficulty other than the ACT and in South Australia, where there were slight moves down. But in the other states, significant pressures. Now this is a combination of interest rates rising and also the fact that many are still underwater from a cash flow perspective or indeed have vacant property that they have still not been able to let. Overall 25.6% of investors are in difficulty and that translates to about 785,000 stressed investors. And then if we look at the aggregate measure, the total household count and percentage with financial stress, overall it's 44.03%, which is more than 4.6 million households have financial pressures. That's nearly half the country, which is a pretty amazing number. And there's been an increase in every single state over the last month. Then if I look at the segment analysis for a stress, and we've seen significant rises amongst those in the battling urban segment and the disadvantaged fringe segment with mortgages. 
These are people who've bought quite recently. Quite a few of them are recent first-time buyers, and they tend to live on the outskirts of our major cities. We also saw a significant rise in those in the young growing family category, and that includes a significant proportion of first-time buyers. We're now at 77.3% of young growing families in mortgage stress. Turning to rental stress, we find a different footprint. Those who are more mature, stable families who are renting are struggling now. But the most significant group are first-generation Australians who have entered the country relatively recently and are renting. 61.3% of those are in difficulty. Closely followed by young affluent households at 60.65%. So these are people with bigger incomes, but also bigger commitments. And the overall financial stress was rising amongst the battling urban the first generation Australians, the young affluent, and the young growing family. And I will just highlight again that the stressed investors are most likely to be the more affluent households, the exclusive professionals at 45%, and young affluent households at 50%. So there is a lot going on here. Now, if I then turn to look at the individual postcodes most impacted, Firstly, a mortgage stress. Postcode 2560 has the most significant, with more than 10,300 households now exposed. That's about 84% of those borrowing in the postcode. And that includes areas like Campbelltown. Then we go across to WA to postcode 6065, to places like Wanneroo and Tapping. And there, more than 10,000 households are in mortgage stress. That's about 65% of households in that particular postcode. Then we go to Berwick and Harkaway in postcode 3806. There, 9,500 households are in stress. And that's 95% of households in that Victorian postcode. Then we go to Toowoomba, postcode 4350. There we have 9,400 households in mortgage stress. Around 60% of households are in difficulty. Then we go to Narrow Warren South, postcode 3805 in Victoria. That includes Fountain Gate, Narrow Warren, and Narrow Warren South, actually. 8,800 households are in mortgage stress. That's around 72% of households. And then we go down to Tasmania to postcode 7250, which includes the areas around Launceston. And there we have 8,300 households in difficulty. And a significant proportion, close to all households, are under difficulty in Tasmania. That's a combination of very low incomes, very significant property rises, and significant mortgage exposure. Then we go across to Ballarat, to postcode 3350, and there we have around 8,000 households in mortgage stress, or 82%. And then we go to WA6030, including places like Quinns Rock, Tamala Park and Ridgewood, at 7,500, 84%. And then we go to Victorian postcode 3810, Pakenham and Pakenham Lower, at 73.7%. That's more than 7,200 households. Then another postcode in Victoria 3037 with 7,200 or 69.5% in Delahaye, Hillside and Sydenham. And then we get a postcode 2620 around Queanbeyan with 7,100 households. And then Mount Annan 2567 which includes Harrington Park and Narrowland with 7,000. And then Frankston, postcode 3199 in Victoria. And so it goes on. If I then move on to rental stress, the postcode with the most significant rental stress is postcode 3000, Melbourne, Victoria, with more than 13,000 in rental stress. That's 73%. Then we go to Liverpool, Chipping Norton, postcode 3170, with more than 12,000 or 72% of households in rental stress. 
Then we go to Toowoomba 4350 with more than 11,000 in rental stress or 50%. Then we go to Millbank in Queensland 4670 with more than 10,000 in rental stress or 61%. And we go across to postcode 2560, including Campbelltown, Woodbine, St. Helen Park, Roos. There, more than 9,800 are in rental stress at 79%. Then we go to postcode 2770, including Lethbridge Park and Mount Druitt, at 9,250, or 76% of households in rental stress. Then we go to postcode 2540, which includes places like St George's Basin and Sussex Inlet on the south coast, with more than 9,200 in rental stress at 70%. Then we go over to Queensland to postcode 4305 around Ipswich, with more than 9,000 in rental stress at 69%. Then we go to Grey Stains in New South Wales, 2145, including Wentworthville, South Wentworthville and Westmead, with 8,999 households in rental stress at 68%. Then we go up to Queensland to Southport and Labrador, postcode 4215, with 8,967 households or 54% in rental stress. And then we go to Gosford in the Central Coast, 2250 with 8,836 in rental stress or 75.4% of households in rental stress. Moving on to stressed investors, the postcode with the most stressed investors is now postcode 2065, which includes places like Crow's Nest, Greenwich, Narrenburn, St. Leonard's with more than 5,000 households in stressed position. Then we go to Melbourne, Melbourne 3000, maybe not surprising given the rental stress we saw, that there are more than 4,600 stressed investors there. Then we go to Surfers Paradise in Main Beach, postcode 4217 with more than 3,900. Then we go across to WA to 6163, which includes Sampson, Spearwood, North Coogee, with more than 3,700 stressed investors. Then we go to Mandra, Meadow Springs, that's south of Perth, of course, 6210, with more than 3,600 stressed investors. And then we come back over to Sydney, 2010, Surrey Hills and Darlinghurst, with 3,400 stressed investors. We go to Victoria, to St Kilda, Postcode 3182 with 3,240 households. Back to New South Wales, 2145, including Wentworthville and Westmead, with 3,193 stressed investors. Back to Victoria, to South Yarra, 3141, with 3,147. Then to Queensland, to 4570 to include Banks Pocket, Fisherman's Pocket and a lot of other areas there too with more than 3,000 stressed investors. Then back to New South Wales to Chatswood and Chatswood West, postcode 2067 with more than 2,900 stressed investors and Toowoomba, postcode 4350 with more than 2,900 stressed investors in that area. And finally, of course, the financial stress, the aggregate measure, shows that postcode 2560, which includes Campbelltown and areas around there with more than 22,000 households registering financial stress. Postcode Melbourne 3000 has more than 18,500 in rental stress. Bundaberg Postcode 4670 has more than 17,800 households. Bidwell 2770, which includes Mount Druitt and other areas in that area, including Lethbridge Park, more than 17,700. Postcode 4305, including Ipswich and areas around there, has more than 16,700. 
Then we go across to Greystains, postcode 2145, with more than 15,900. That includes South Wentworthville and Wentworthville, as well as Greystains and Westmead. Then we go to Ballarat, postcode 3350, with more than 15,900. Point Cook and Derrimont, Werribee, postcode 3030, with more than 15,300 in financial stress. That's more than 42% of households. We then go to Queensland, a postcode 4300, Belbert Park, which includes Springfield, Springfield Lakes. And there, more than 14,700 are in financial stress. We go to South Tamworth, postcode 2340, which includes Oxley Vale as well as Tamworth itself. 14,714 or 69% of households. Then we go to the west to Tapping, postcode 6065, which includes Wanneroo, Tapping and Hocking, with more than 14,677 households, 65% in total. Another one in Victoria at Hopper's Crossing, postcode 3029 at 14,518. And then back to New South Wales, to Crows Nest, Greenwich, Narrenburn, St Leonard's, postcode 2065, with more than 14,000 in financial stress and 94%. I could go on. Now, the point I want to make here is there are different types of households in different types of locations, all experiencing difficulty. One of the most significant groups are those on the suburban outskirts who have bought recently, often in those new, highly developed estates. They've got big mortgages, their incomes are not keeping up. But we also see a number of regional areas struggling now, including Ballarat, for example. And we also see people closer into the city who are also more affluent on one hand, but are also more stretched on the other. So, frankly, wherever you look, we definitely have issues with regard to what's going on with financial stress. Those who are renting, those with a mortgage, and even those investing have problems in their own right. Now, I will just remind you that the prospective interest rate rises that we're going to see is going to have a profound effect. So, for example, a 1.99% mortgage rate over 30 years, the loan repayments per 100000 would be $365 a month. Of course, most mortgages are a lot bigger than that, so you multiply it by how many hundred thousands that you may be borrowing. But on the other hand, if rates then rose by 1% to 3%, the principal interest repayments over the same mortgage duration for $100,000 goes to $422 a month. That's a rise of 15.6%. And if the mortgage rate went to 4%, which would be just 2% higher, that's an increase of 31% based on a typical mortgage per 100,000. So these are significant pressures coming on households. And I have to tell you that many households have not been budgeting sufficiently well to cope with these sorts of increases. Now, not everybody will be hit tomorrow. Some people have fixed mortgages. Some people, of course, have buffers which they can tap into. But the fact of the matter is, if your cash flow out is bigger than your income coming in, those buffers get drained quite quickly, whether it's a loan, whether it's actually deposits that you already hold. Eventually, unless you change your behaviour, things go pear-shaped. And of course, the fact of the matter is that rates probably will rise faster than people were expecting. The RBA is talking at least another 2%. And the markets, of course, are talking even more than that. So I thought what we might now do is look at some of the stress mapping. And to explain how we do this, stress mapping is based on the count of households in difficulty. So here's an example. This is around Sydney. And again, the redder areas are those with highest counts. And so you can see here that closer into Sydney, things aren't too bad. But if you go west, you start seeing places like Lane Cove and Ryde, Parramatta, the hills. And if you go further west to places like Liverpool and Campbelltown, you can see that there are considerable pressures and very large counts of households 
that are in difficulty. If we then turn to Melbourne, one of the observations again is that the areas to the east and the west and the north of the city are all looking pretty unfortunate. There are one or two hot spots, particularly beyond Dandelong. That includes places like Narra Warren, for example, or there. We also have significant hot spots over to the west of Melbourne and to the north. Closer in, well, it's not quite so serious in terms of the numbers, but of course the proportions can be quite high. If we then turn to look at Brisbane and the surrounding areas, we can see that closer into the city there is not too much to talk about, but as you go south or north or west, things get more troublesome. There's pressure down on the Gold Coast, significant pressure over towards Ipswich and beyond, and also areas to the north of Sydney up towards Morton Bay, where again there are issues. And whilst the total number might be a little lower than in Sydney or Melbourne, the pressures are really now starting to hit. Turning to Adelaide, again, we find a similar story with some areas doing OK, but the hot spot up in Salisbury, 5108, and south of the city is also registering. And if you go over to places like Mount Barker, again, significant pressures there too. Absolute counts will be lower, of course, because the population density is lower. But nevertheless, there are some troublesome hotspots in and around Adelaide. And if we go across to Western Australia, again, it's a similar story. Closer into the city, not too many issues. But if you look south Perth and south towards Canning and even further south or go north, up towards Wanneroo and places like that on the coast. Again, there are considerable pressures on households and the counts are getting quite high, particularly up there north and indeed south of Perth. So once again, we are finding consistent patterns. A lot of the areas and stress in Western Australia are newly developed areas where people are highly mortgaged and highly exposed to rising interest rates at this point. And, of course, my old favourite of Mandurah is still in difficulty further south. And finally, if we look at the area around Hobart, again, what we find is some degree of stress. Obviously, the counts are lower because the population density is lower. But as you go north of Hobart City, you start to see some problems. And, in fact, those problems do span out quite significantly. And just to stress the point, areas to the north of Tasmania around Launceston are one particular area where there are considerable issues at the moment. And the Darwin area, of course, has very low population density, so the total numbers are relatively low. But even here, we do see some significant pressures. And if we look at places like Palmerston, for example, postcode 832, there are significant issues there. Now, turning to rental stress, and we'll start with Sydney first. Uh, somewhat similar story to an extent insofar that there are hot spots over in the west and uh, Parramatta, for example, Blacktown areas and down towards Campbelltown. But it's also interesting to note that there are more pressures closer in, particularly in some of the more affluent suburbs, for example, places like Mossman and Bondi, where, of course, more affluent households are living but they're having difficulty meeting their repayments. So in and around Melbourne, we do see some similar hot spots, particularly to the west and the east of the city, but Melbourne 3000 right there in the centre is definitely a hot spot when it comes to rental stress. And as we pull out a little further, we can see that the pressure extends around the bay and down toward Dandelong, as well as to the north, up towards Hume. Brisbane's quite an interesting story as well, insofar that there are hot spots not only close into the city, but also to the west, of course, including Ipswich and places like that, and to the south, down towards the Gold Coast. 
So this is a function of significant pressure on the rental sector, significant rental rises. And by the way, the yields on investment property in and around Brisbane still are significantly higher than in Sydney or Melbourne. In and around Adelaide, there are hotspots too, although the population density is somewhat lower, so it's not as severe. But nevertheless, whether you look north of the city or south of the city, there are some important hotspots. Turning to Perth, close into the city, there are some hotspots. And as you pull out, you can see that the story of rental stress, to an extent, mirrors the mortgage stress results we saw a little while ago, insofar that there are significant problems to the north and the south of the city as well, particularly in the newly developed areas to the north, close to places like Wanneroo. And rental stress in and around Hobart does also register. Again, the population density is lower, but the areas over towards Clarence are definitely a hot spot to watch. So you can see that the graphical representation of the data really does contrast the hotspots from other postcodes. And that's really the point. This is a patchwork story. And as I explained earlier, this is a combination of different types of households in different locations with different types of property. Nevertheless, the trajectories are definitely not looking very positive. Now, we can just briefly touch on my scenarios. This is a way of just thinking about how the future may play out. No scenario is right. It's just an indicative trajectory along a different set of assumptions. And here are the latest that I have. So the RBA baseline is, within the next couple of years, cash rate at 2.5%. Unemployment rate stays low. The mortgage rates, therefore, are around 55 to 6%, somewhere around there. Mortgage stress remains quite high. The losses remain reasonable, but home prices slide somewhere between 15 and 25 percent. And you'd expect to see rate rises and the end of quantitative easing. I think probably there's about a 10 percent chance that the RBA has it right. Now, I then run some alternative scenarios. There's a scenario that says they don't end up taking rates as high. They might take them up and bring them back. That would have, though, already an impact on a higher unemployment. Mortgage rate wouldn't be quite so high. Mortgage stress will be slightly higher. The losses will be higher. And therefore, whilst there is some slight possibility of small rises in home prices, there is still a significant slide to the downside. We would expect to see some incentives there in term funding facility version 2, in other words, cheap funding for the banks. That's still my central scenario, which is giving a 50% probability. However, we must consider also a longer term crunch where inflation is a problem and they crash the economy. And in the meantime, they have to bring rates down low, perhaps in even to negative territory. Unemployment will be higher. Mortgage rate will be lower. Mortgage stress will be somewhat lower. The losses will be higher but home prices will be 10 or 30% down, something like that. And we will be seeing more quantitative easing, more fiscal support and negative interest rates. I give that a 25% rating. And then below that, there is what I call the multi-wave disruption, which basically talks about some of the international issues coming in over the top, China, for example, the war in Europe, and other issues too, which requires even low interest rates, well into zero or below territory. The unemployment rate will be a lot higher. Mortgage rates will be almost nothing at 1%. The mortgage stress rates will be very high. The bank losses would be much higher. And home prices would have slid somewhere between 30 and 45%. And we could be expected to see quantitative easing and even some support for the banks, either directly or indirectly, um, bailed in or bailed out. I give that a 15% rating. And it's worth saying that I take those different scenarios and use them for some analysis down at individual postcode levels. Now, those of you who subscribe via Patreon will have access to this data directly. But I thought I'd just share a few scenarios with people so you can see how I'm thinking about this now. 
So here is my first example. I'm looking at postcode 2000, which includes Miller's Point and places like that in the centre of Sydney, Dawes Point, the rocks. And there we are looking at scenarios, best case of a small fall in prices for houses, perhaps cumulatively maybe down 4%. The worst case scenario is significantly adverse. And the base case is with prices correcting around 28%. Whereas for units, the best case scenario is a very small fall around 2.9% over the next three years. The base case 20% and the worst case 34%. And it's worth highlighting here that from an investment perspective, the net investment returns are under 1% at the moment for investors in this particular postcode. If I then look at another postcode, we'll go to Wollongong, one that I, of course, I'm quite close to here. So there, the best case scenario is a potential small improvement in home values, maybe 5% over three years. Units slightly lower. But there are also scenarios where prices could considerably be lower, maybe down 20% over three years for houses, slightly less for units. Worst case scenario, down 38% and 28% respectively. And it's worth highlighting here, we do have some degree of mortgage stress, but the real story is rental stress, where 60% of households are in difficulty at the moment. And if I go to postcode 3000, that's of course the centre of Victoria, there there's almost no prospect of capital appreciation, even in the best case scenario, over the next three years. And there are considerable risks to the downside, maybe up to 40% or 30% for units. And once again, the investment returns are extremely low, under 1% in this particular area. Now, to contrast that, if I go to Northcote in Victoria, postcode 3070, there the proportion of borrowers in mortgage stress is only 22%, rental stress is at 42%, and total financial stress is at 41.9%. And as a result of that, we can see on our best scenario maybe an 8% or 9% rise in home prices over the next three years and even unit prices up about 6%. That said, in our worst case scenarios, we could see prices fall perhaps 16 or even 34% for houses over three years, or 11 and 25% over the next three years for units. And it's worth highlighting again here that the net investment returns are next to zero, which is one of the reasons why stressed investors at 36.9% are so high. Here's an example again up in Brisbane. That includes Brisbane and Spring Hill. And here the scenario is more positive with, in our best case scenario, maybe a 10% rise over three years for houses and maybe a 7% rise for units over the next three years. That said, in our base and worst case, we see considerable falls with maybe 30% falls in houses and 23% falls in units. Here the net investment returns are about 2%, a bit better than down south, and the gross investment returns are about 5, 5 5.3. But again, it's worth highlighting that whilst there are some people in mortgage stress, around 27%, it's really a story of rental stress and investor stress, which is driving the financial outcomes here. And going out to Redcliffe and Scarborough, Another story again where rental stress and mortgage stress is pretty high, around 50% of borrowers are in mortgage stress. And once again, we see potentially some rises for houses over the best case in three years, some for units too, but the worst case scenario is still a considerable fall. If I go to Adelaide and look there. One of the things I want to highlight here is that while there is some mortgage stress against rental stress is a real issue and stressed investors are also coming through. So there is a small possibility in the best case scenario of continued rises in property, although we think the next 12 months they go might go into reverse first. Units 
pretty close too, but there are also considerable downside risks. And if we go to West Lakes Shore, postcode 5020, again, there are considerable upsides for Adelaide property for houses, 13% over three years, and even units up 9 or 10%. But the downside risks are also there with considerable falls. We have very small counts here in this postcode, but even so, we see that both the mortgage stress and the rental stress rates are quite high. If I go across to Perth, we see potentially small rises for houses over the next three years and for units too, quite close really, but again with downside risks. But it is worth noting that those in mortgage stress around 50% or renters at 63% would suggest some downside pressure and 65.4% of stressed investors. Net investment returns about 1.2% at the moment all in. That means I'm counting the costs of the mortgage and also the costs of managing the property. And if I go out to postcode 6050, there is an interesting story here because there's no mortgage stress showing. Some rental stress is showing, however. As a result of that, we could certainly see a 10% plus rise in property prices for houses over the next three years and about 9% for units. Best case, although again, there is a downside scenario, which is not so good. And net investment returns are around 2%. And if I go down to Hobart, which includes the areas in and around the centre of the city, there's around 23% of those in mortgage stress. Rental stress is very high at 57%. And we still see in our best case scenario further increases in value in and around Hobart, maybe up to 9% over the next three years for houses and 6% for units. And the investment returns at 2.3% are some of the best in the country. No surprise then to find that some investors are looking in and around Hobart to buy investment property because the returns and capital growth are still there. And if we go out to Kingston and Kingston Beach, where we find about 48% of households are in mortgage stress and 36% are in rental stress, there is still some upside to houses, maybe 11% over three years, based on our scenarios, best case, and around 9% for units. However, there are also considerable falls if things go the wrong way, and falls of maybe 31% and 23% respectively. And once again, net investment returns more than 2.3%. So that's pretty powerful relative to others that we've seen. And finally, a quick look at Darwin City, where there is really no registered mortgage stress at the moment. Rental stress is quite low too. And as a result of that, we see a growth to property values over the next two or three years, maybe up to 16% for houses. There aren't that many, of course, in the centre of town. Or units, where there's a lot more, but again, growth, maybe 11%. And the net investment return is about 2.4%. So at the moment, property investing in and around Darwin could well be worth considering. And if we look out into the Darwin suburbs, I've gone to postcode 820, which is quite a big area, but includes places like East Point, Fanny Bay, Stuart Park, the Gardens, the Narrows. Once again, mortgage stress is there, rental stress is there, but not dramatically high. And we do see some prospective growth in value over the next three years based on the best case scenario, both for units and houses. Although, of course, if things pan out worse, then effectively there could be further falls. Net investment returns are slightly lower at 1.9% at the moment based on our data. So what does this all tell us? Well, it tells us that we are moving into another phase of stress in Australia. More households are going to have cash flow issues ahead. Of course, more price rises are coming through in September. The petrol support goes away. And it'll be interesting to see whether Labor does anything else to help with gas prices or electric prices over this period. But the bottom line is this, that households are going to feel it. Many households are in difficulty. And as always, at this point, when I talk about stress, I highlight the fact that there is a temptation, if you have a property, to pull out more equity and try and pay off the debt, 
well that may work but it only works if you change your behavior if you continue to spend the same way you'll just end up in the same place again with less equity with interest rates rising of course more people are likely to be struggling and one of the things that i highlighted in my conversation with steve mickenbecker from cancel the other day was check your interest rate you may well be able to get a lower rate somewhere else that could certainly help the second point is that if you are in financial difficulty, in fact, whether you are a renter or indeed if you are a mortgage holder, it's important to talk to your lender, your bank. They may be able to help, particularly if there's a mortgage issue, because they do have hardship provisions. Unfortunately, quite often now what we're finding is that the banks tend to direct people to sell. They'd much prefer them to sell rather than be foreclosed later. And so that's one of the reasons why property listings are growing. The other observation is, and it's one that I keep coming back to, is many households don't know where they are because they don't maintain a cash flow. And it's very important to understand where the money's coming in and where it's going out to. And there are some very good tools on the Money Smart Asset site, which allows you to quite quickly get across your cash flow. Less than half of households in our analysis actually really understand where the money's going. And by the way, this isn't just for those households that are new to budgeting or first-time buyers. Some of the more affluent households in our surveys are stressed, highly stressed in fact, and don't know it. So pretty much wherever you are across the income spectrum, running a cash flow is a very good idea. And finally, I'd make this point, that given the trajectory now of interest rates, the lack of growth in income that we're seeing ahead and the fact that costs of living are going to continue to rise, if you don't get financial stress under control quickly, it soon gets out of control. And once it gets out of control, it is very difficult to rectify. So just putting your head in the sand and saying she'll be right won't work. It is really important to plan, understand your finances, and make some tough decisions, maybe giving up some of those subscription services if you don't really need them, maybe eating out less, maybe buying food to cook at home more. We are, I think, in for a bit of a wobbly journey. And bear this in mind again, interest rates will be rising over the next few months quite fast. Those interest rates will flow through to higher mortgages. Those with savings may be able to get slightly higher returns. But for those in stress because of mortgage stress or rental stress, the only answer is to trim your budget to suit the current conditions. That's tough, but the sooner you start, the easier it will be to handle. I'm Martin North from Digital Finance Analytics. Many thanks for watching, and I'll see you again next time.